Good afternoon to you from Wilmington, North Carolina. I am Mark Suddeth, and this is the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. Yes, it is. Why? Because of that. Well, what is this? What's this? We're going to take a look at that and more. It is Monday, the 16th of January, 2023. So glad you can join me as we talk about this and some other features in today's update. I am back from California. was out there for the better part of a week observing, reporting on, and studying the atmospheric river phenomenon. I'm going to talk about that towards the end of today's update. All right. All right. Let's start off with a look at the satellite animation. Wow. That's pretty impressive for January. Look at that. You can't miss it. Looks like it's a storm, a tropical storm out there. If this was June, well, first of all, if this was nice voice crack there, if this was June, um, we wouldn't have all this nonsense right here, these shenanigans, as Matt likes to call it. An inside joke there. That's that's a telltale sign of cold air blowing over warm water. So if this was June, you wouldn't see that, first of all. But you might see that because it does look like a tropical system. The reason that it's there, to try to boil this down, Water temperatures are warm, relatively, about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll just call it 70, all right? With all that cold air around, it's easier to squeeze out the instability, to make the instability happen. Remember, instability happens because you have cold air over warm air. And if everything was uniform throughout the atmosphere, you wouldn't have convection, temperature-wise. You have to have differences. And in this case, the air around the system is very cold, anomalously so, and you're able to get that instability or the thunderstorm process to happen. And these thunderstorms are a warming process. Condensation is a warming process, evaporation, a cooling process. So those thunderstorms are releasing heat into the atmosphere. So there are some warm core processes going on because the air is so cold around this system that it's just another mechanism to get what looks like in June through November a tropical system over the waters even though it is only January. I hope that makes even a shred of sense. It's also <clears throat> kind of mentioned here in the special outlook issued by the National Hurricane Center. It is non-tropical. It's mentioned that there are some uh, cold air I mean, it says it right here. It's embedded in a cold air mass with nearby frontal boundaries. So they are not looking at it being purely tropical or subtropical. However, it is forecast to head towards colder waters and then across Atlantic Canada by early tomorrow. They don't think it's going to become, uh, again, a classifiable cyclone, tropical, subtropical, whatever. But, you know, as I talk about often, those are just labels. They're like little sticky notes that we put on things as humans. We have to label everything. I get it. And, you know, despite differences of opinion, what people might think the Hurricane Center should do, it's their call. And it doesn't matter in the end. The impacts are headed for Atlantic Canada by later tonight and into and through tomorrow. So that's what we need to take away from this. People are talking about it, though, for sure. On Twitter, Tomer, uh, scrolling down here, Kalen, and this is just my Twitter feed. You can see what I follow, right? And um, I don't know how you say that name. Looks like Nikhil, maybe? I'm not sure, but I love the annotations. Lots of people talking about this. David Roth, uh, Andy, Andy Hazelton chiming in. Very interesting feature. Not classifiable, apparently. What, Whatever. It's going to head up towards Atlantic Canada, and that's what matters in terms of impacts. Now, as I mentioned, the water temperatures are pretty warm out here, especially relative to average. This is where the system is located roughly. Water temperatures are warmer than the long-term average. That helps, certainly. And then the actual sea surface temperatures, uh, system being located again roughly in this region right here, water temperatures at eh, 21, maybe 22 Celsius, depending on how close it is to the north wall of the Gulf Stream. And, you know, that's about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 68 to 70 Fahrenheit. And that warm water with the cold air above it, that's really helping to squeeze out that convection. Very interesting to see a novelty. Um, and if it gets a name, great. If, do if it doesn't, whatever. It's, uh, it's going to impact Canada, and that's what matters the most, right? There it is in the GFS here, the analysis from the 12Z run. 
There's Nova Scotia there. This is Newfoundland here. And we put this into motion via frame by frame. And yeah, it pivots up into eastern Nova Scotia, kind of in the vicinity there of where Fiona, uh, what is that, the Avalon Peninsula, or is that farther east in Newfoundland? You would think that I would know that. That's okay. I don't know everything. And sometimes I screw up. The bottom line is it will be coming into eastern, it's Cape Breton. There we go. Come on, Mark. The Cape Breton area, close to them, Avalon, Avalon Peninsula is Newfoundland. Um, and no, I didn't look it up. My brain just started working better. It pivots in to the area between Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And uh, it could bring some gusty winds and locally rough seas. So just be ready for that. All right. Now, look, since we are doing sort of a hurricane outlook and discussion here, um, we're going to continue with this. And then we're going to go into lower 48 weather and some severe stuff. All right. One of the things we look for. And even though I was in California for the better part of a week, I've been watching things, keeping an eye on things. And there's a lot of talk, not just about this non-tropical area of low pressure. That certainly is a big topic. But also, in the background, more chatter about the potential of El Nino coming into play. The anomaly or the anomalously warm Pacific, the tropical Pacific, switching from La Nina, where we are now, to El Nino by the time we get to hurricane season. One of the measurements of that, you know, that I talk about often, at least once a week, the SOI. And right now, the indices here are all very positive. Uh, the 90-day is a healthy 12. The 30-day is at 19. The contributor for today is 3. And you can see we've been generally positive here uh, through the last several months. Yes, in the last few days, it has gone down just a little bit. But we're going to really need to tank these numbers to get the INSO state to flip. And what I mean by that is right now, the area, and this is a generalization, it really is an oversimplification, but it helps to explain things in simple terms. Right now, with the SOI being positive, the air pressure is lower in the Western Pacific than it is in the Eastern Pacific. And so because the air flows from high to low, right? On this planet anyway, we have generally steadfast and strong trade winds blowing from the east, strong easterlies. We talk about the wind from the direction it's coming from. So easterly winds mean they are coming from the east, blowing to the west. That is what you have, generally speaking, with a positive SOI. All right. When you flip it and you get a negative SOI, the opposite happens. You typically have lower pressure in the eastern Pacific, higher pressure in the western Pacific, and you get westerlies that come through here. And they come through in these bursts, and it helps to drag the warm western Pacific both at the surface and the subsurface by upwelling warmer water that's far below when you switch the pressure pattern. But this hasn't happened yet. No, that 19 there, that 12 there, we've got a long way to go. Now, that doesn't mean it won't happen. If we look at the uh, CFS, we watch this about once a week as well. A couple of wild runs lately. Some of these here were way off the chart almost. If they could go off the chart, they would have. We don't want a plus 3 in so. All right, we don't. We don't want the Nino 3.4 to hit plus 3. That would be very bad. It would be a very hot planet if that happens because... The tropical Pacific does act like a radiator. It either adds more heat when we get an El Nino, or it removes heat, generally speaking, and energy and moisture when we have a La Nina. So we don't want plus three, and we don't want minus three either. Somewhere around neutral, you know, the Goldilocks zone, as we like to call it. So we watch this uh, particular model. There's lots of other models, consensuses, and whatever. I like this one. It's pretty reliable. Yes, you get these wild runs from time to time. And it's interesting, the most recent runs, most of the blues here, which are your latest forecast members, eight of them, most of those are on the south side, if you will, of the ensemble mean. You know how they say the stock market went south today. That's just a term. Yes, they are generally uh, less than the ensemble mean. There's a couple of them that are still pretty robust. You're going to get these flip-flops, but the overall ensemble suggesting just shy of about one degree Celsius 
by October. Middle of hurricane season in here. Yeah, you know, a weak El Nino, maybe. Probably wouldn't be enough to thwart, if that's a word that we can use, the hurricane season because look at how warm the Atlantic still is relative to average, especially the eastern Atlantic up here, the northeast Atlantic. This is very important. You look at some of the correlations that Dr. Klotzbach uses, and you look at the northeast Atlantic off the coast of the Iberian Peninsula, the Canary Islands, that is running well above the long-term average. It really is. Look at the scale, 2, 3 degrees Celsius, some of these reds. Absolutely. Your ENSO still holding on to La Nina. So even if this flips to uh, decently warmer than average, a degree Celsius, let's just call it 1 degree Celsius, and if this stays warm, I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be hard-pressed to say we're going to have a below-average hurricane season until proven otherwise. And, just so you know, the Gulf of Mexico is basically uh, non-influenced by the state of the ENSO. And in other words, El Nino does not impact the Gulf of Mexico, neither does La Nina. The Gulf is generally independent. The El Nino and the La Ninas typically affect this area mostly. Even the eastern tropical Atlantic is just too far away for the state of the ENSO to really bother it. So uh, interesting to look at now that we are less than five months from the start of the hurricane season. We'll be watching this, though. We'll take a look at it every week. All right, real quick, I talked about California. I was just out there. This, despite the fact that, yes, it is disruptive, and yes, there has been loss of life. That is terrible. We don't want to ever diminish that. But this is a good thing to see, the snowpack that slowly melts off uh, during the uh, spring and summer. That adds to the overall water supply, the reservoirs. We want this. This is good for the West. It is good for North America. It is good for geopolitical reasons. It really is. You think we have issues fighting over fossil fuels as a peoples? We don't want to fight over water. Water, believe me. So this is a good thing to see. The atmospheric river situation, where they're just one after the other, should start to calm down. And I can show you that as we progress through today's GFS. So there's the first system of uh, the week here, moving through the Intermountain West, eventually spilling into the Rockies. And yes, maybe some good snows there for Colorado. We need that snowpack in the Rockies. That helps to feed those rivers, including the all-important Colorado River. But if you're a big snow lover, Denver, yeah, you might get some snow. Uh, coming up midweek or so. Another system starts to come into the Pacific Northwest. These are going to become less and less potent as the overall pattern that has given uh, us all of these different storms for California, that pattern is going to change and kind of relax a little bit. So the first system, let's just go back. There it is in California. It ejects out into the plains. Maybe some severe weather. We're going to look at that in a minute for parts of the Deep South. Because the Gulf of Mexico, yes, still running well above normal, helping to fuel these mid-latitude cyclones and the energy associated with them. But as we get out to about day four here, look, the weather for the lower 48 at uh, day five, right there, right around day five, whew, that's lovely. Everybody can just take the, if you're in network weather and whatever, uh, what is that, Saturday? Just call in. You know, nothing really to report. Some light snow maybe in Kansas and Nebraska, a weather feature moving into the Pacific Northwest, and that's about it. But then we jump right back into things early next week, and uh, there we are a week out. Some rain for the south. No major Arctic air intrusions where we see the jet stream just crashing in. Nothing like that. No big storms over the next week, it looks like. Just your garden variety, winter weather. Most of the snow in the northern parts of the country. The south, uh, of course, in the warm sector with rain and even the possibility of severe weather, which helps me segue very nicely to this. The Storm Prediction Center Outlook. This is for today. This is day one. Enough instability to have a few thunderstorms out here, very scattered. More so in Nevada. I have to wake up Paul, tell him about that. Our good friend Paul, he works up on mountaintops fixing radios and related for the state of Nevada. And then in around that area, the Four Corners region, well, the western side of it anyway, 
Um, yeah, some thunderstorms possible with that cold air. Remember, cold air, cold air aloft. That's a big mechanism to get instability. And then uh, some you know, very low-end type thunderstorm threats for portions of the, uh, what is that, the Corn Belt or something like that? I don't know. I mean, they grow corn in Iowa. Let's move along, though, before I screw up my geography. There's the Four Corners. I knew it was in there somewhere. That's tomorrow. And again, just a slight, and it's, I say slight, that's not what it shows. It's uh, a very low risk of any thunderstorms at all. Just a couple of them out there. And then we move ahead to day three. And then we see that slight risk there in the deep south where we have had, unfortunately, a string of severe weather this off season. I mean, it's like the second season. There is no off season. And this is really starting to become problematic. We saw what happened in Alabama most recently. We had the events before that uh, where we had tornadoes in Dallas. We had tornadoes in and around New Orleans. We had that last year. Something's changing, and I think it's that very warm gulf helping to fuel this. Lots of studies being done, Mississippi State University and others. I just know people there. That's why I mentioned them by name. Uh, and here it is again coming up in just a few days so pay attention to that if you live in the deep south it might get to the point where they issue an enhanced risk for part of this area so pay attention all right looking out beyond the time frame of day three that would be days four five six seven eight luckily nothing that far out in time when they show up that far out in time in the winter that's a bad sign even in the spring but in the winter it's just not as expected right Right. All right, so hopefully I explained what's this, what that's all about. Again, the big thing is the cold air over the relatively warm Atlantic really helped to spawn that. And again, I know a lot of people are going to be hemming and hawing about it should be named. They name stuff that doesn't look nearly as impressive as that. Give these folks a break. You know, maybe they go back retrospectively and name it later, but it doesn't matter. We've got to get away from this idea that everything has to be named or classified pay attention more to the impacts. What's it going to do to me? That's what you need to ask, ask yourself in these situations and let the other stuff just fall where it may. It matters in the scheme of things. I get it. But right now, it's more important to focus on, hey, this is going to hit Atlantic Canada with potential impacts no matter what the heck we call it. All right. All right. That is it for me for today and for the rest of the week. As always, glad you could tune in. Don't forget, please do subscribe to the channel, like the videos with that thumbs up, hit the notification bell. Apparently you get notified. I've been hearing that maybe you don't. I don't know. Whatever. I'm just glad you watch. I do appreciate it. I am Mark Suddeth. We are Hurricane Track. I'll talk to you again next Monday.